responded immediately to that scene and were at the exact location where John Parsons had went into the woods off this bicycle. We could secure the perimeter just because that was the perimeter was the roads that, that encircled it. We literally put a ring of steel around a three mile area. It was probably some of the most rugged terrain in, in Ross County. Uh, but we felt we probably had a pretty good shot at him. I had a head start on him. Soon I could hear the bloodhounds and helicopters approaching. So I was trying to keep moving as fast as I could while doing as much backtracking and zigzagging as I could to throw the hounds off. We gridded off at the area and did skirmish lines and went down through the woods inch by inch looking for John Parsons. I felt that John Parsons would not be taken alive. I, I honestly felt we would end up, or somebody would end, up, would end up killing John Parsons in a shootout. I was headed in the direction where there seemed to be the least noise from quad bikes or dogs barking. Pretty soon that forced me into a bottleneck. I knew I couldn't cross any fields, or I'd be spotted in the open. I decided to head up towards Route 28 and hope that I could somehow make it across. There was officers stationed every so many hundred feet apart who had eye contact with each officer. If he would get out into the open air, that somebody, an officer, would see him. Above me, there was a plane and at least two helicopters circling over. We brought in some helicopters that had some uh, thermal imaging devices. This would have been October, November, where the leaves were off the trees and all that. Uh, it had been over within an hour. It just the, the, the visibility was zero once you got under the, the foliage. And that foiled the infrared stuff, and he knew it. John Parsons knew that. By the time I reached the wood line along Route 28, there was too much law enforcement traffic. I had no choice but to look for a good place to hide and hope they didn't find me while I waited for the right moment to cross. First 36 hours of that, I never went home. And even after that, uh, I'd go home, take a shower, get a four or five hours sleep, and then we would be right back out there uh, in the woods. Temperatures in the wood there probably 110 degrees or hotter, maybe. You could only work the dogs maybe 30 to 45 minutes. You had to bring them out of the field to cool them down. We knew John Parsons was suffering a lot worse than we were. I mean, the conditions were very harsh. John Parsons wasn't going to last long out there. I hadn't had anything to drink since the escape. I had to come out of my hiding spot and find water. I was having trouble even thinking straight. I knew it was a huge risk, but I was desperate. That night, after midnight sometime, I started moving along the wood line trying to find a gap in the vehicles where I could cross Route 28. I began keeping count on how long between each pass of helicopter or plane. At that time, it was averaging about 45 seconds in between flyovers. Now there was no turning back. I sat there until it seemed like there was silence from the road and above. And then I ran. I couldn't believe it. I'd made it across without being seen. But I knew they weren't just going to give up. It felt like the entire world was trying to hunt me down. We felt that at 72 hours, he had gotten out of the perimeter. So we used every asset we had to, to try to pin him in. 
We just didn't get the job done. There was only one place he was going to go, and that was family. So we started uh, doing some intense surveillance and interrogation of the family. All his friends and you know even some of his relatives are saying that that you know he was an outdoorsman. We learned that his mother had a tent and some other items set up on their back porch that John was supposed to come in and pick up, but he never came in to got it. After I had gotten through the perimeter, I realized I'd been bit by something. It looked a lot like a brown recluse spider bite. I knew without treatment it would become gangrenous, possibly even kill me. I needed antibiotics. I had one friend who had access to drugs and medical supplies, but he was in Chillicothe. I had no choice. I had to head back into enemy territory where it seemed that every living person was out to get me. I found a place where I could hole up for a while. My friend brought me antibiotics to treat the infection and some other medical supplies to clean the wounds with. I did a lot of thinking about where to go once I was healed enough. I ended up deciding on Canada. We know that guy. We offered a substantial amount of reward money. I don't care how loyal to you are to somebody. You offer them $100,000, they're going to turn you in. They'll turn your mother in for that. Sheriff Nichols. We got a call from a resident. Right. Uh -huh. Said they spotted John Parson on Three Locks Road at a, an old abandoned cabin. Thank you for the call. We'll be there shortly. We immediately sent responded with officers going that area. We were very optimistic we were going to get him that day. You know, the, this would be the day that would conclude the search. We got our formation, immediately went to the cabin, approached the cabin as fast as we could. We were very excited to pinpoint him. The emotion started, the adrenaline started running high. Come outside with your hands up. Let me see them now. We decided to search the cabin. Clear, clear. We found out that he had a trap door in the bottom that he could go right out, and he had already escaped the cabin before we made entry. I'd run from my escape hatch and gone to the river, but stayed in the woods. I ended up on Eastern Avenue, about a mile from the jail I'd escaped from and right next to a lumber company. Directly behind it is the tip of a wooded area owned by the railroad that had been overgrown since I was a kid. It was as good a place as any for a hideout. He's going to commit a crime somewhere. He's going to do something. Somebody's going to see him. He's going to get picked up. I began stealing lumber to build myself a shack. I also rounded up all the things I might need to survive in the wilderness. I needed more light for my shack. The graves of the nearby cemetery were lit up with little solar lights. So I went to a grave to pick up a couple. I looked up at the tombstone to see a big smiling portrait of Officer Larry Cox, the man I was accused of killing. I nearly fell down, I was so stunned. I felt like the man was home. Shame to admit it, but I wrapped up the lights and headed back to my shack. We received hundreds of tips we had to follow up on. 
So you're using all your resources following up these shadow informations that may not be anything at all, but you can't say that. You still have to follow it up. There was moments when you thought, you know, what, what can we do differently? I mean, how are we gonna find out where he is? You know, it was, it was very frustrating at times. Two months had passed since I had escaped from jail, and I felt I was finally healed enough to go ahead and move toward Canada. I asked my connection to get me a gun and one more bottle of antibiotics to go. My plan was to wear a Halloween mask and escape at night so I would blend in with all the trick-or-treaters. Finally, I was going to escape for good, and I could leave my old life behind me. John Parsons has escaped from jail and has been on the run in Ross County, Ohio, for two months. We had got some, some information that said somebody had built a little crude structure in the vicinity of the Eastern Avenue Lumber Company. And we just eaten lunch. We were all standing out behind the law complex kind of talking. And the call came out that John Parsons had been seen in a shack behind the uh, lumber store. So we were going under the assumption that, yeah, he was in there. And, you know, we were ready. I guess we were expecting the worst, you know. We, we thought that he would probably fire on us. He shot one, one officer. You know what's what's going to hurt to shoot one or two more. The minute I saw the tattoo on his leg of a naked lady, I knew it was John Parsons. We had him. Come out with your hands up. It's just kind of a cold chill went through my body. You know, I mean. Elation, I guess. We ordered him to, to put his hands out, you know, and ask him if he had any weapons. He said, no, the only thing he had was a knife. He pretty much, you know, gave up, and when we got him out of the shack, he almost looked relieved. You know, he had that look of relief on his face, but it was over with. It was a huge disappointment to get caught after all I went through, trying to make the escape happen and make it work. And I also felt like life was over for me. I fully expected the death penalty. I went back to the family, and I had got Larry's handcuffs. Hello, John. I said, John, I've got Larry Cox's handcuffs I'm going to put on you. And he said, OK. I had felt that it was only fitting that, that once John Parsons had escaped, that he should go back to jail in Larry's handcuffs. And the little note he left me to buy Ron, first thing I seen John Parsons, I told him, welcome back, John. He knew what I was saying. draw a lot of portraits now and it always brings back the memory of the one I seen on the tombstone that night I do still dream about being chased almost every time I remember my dreams that's what they're about John Parsons will escape some other time it may not be now may not be next year may not be six years maybe ten years from now but somewhere 
sometime 